Hello, testing. One, two, three. There we go. No one said anything that my mic wasn't working. It's fantastic. <laughs> All right. So let's get rolling here. Um, so for uh, this week, I don't know. I'm just everything I just said. Nobody heard. So I'm going to say it again. So this week, um, I'm going to be doing my weekly check-in on Zoom at midnight instead of. Uh, at one o'clock because it's my understanding that most of you are awake at night and sleeping during the day, which is cool. That's like what vampires do, right? So yeah, I'm going to try it at midnight. We'll see how many people show up. Um, I did an astronomy club uh, stargazing party last Friday and we had 15 people show up. So I'm thinking maybe the key is that I need to do it at night. So we're going to give it a shot. If nobody shows up, then we won't do it again. All right, so uh, the question for today is if you could visit any country, what would it be? Uh, no one typed anything in the chat. It's fine. Feelings aren't hurt. Uh, but if I could visit any country in the world, I would visit Australia. Always been somewhere that I've wanted to visit. It's a really long flight. It's like 20-something hours. There isn't a direct flight from Chicago. You have to fly to like San Francisco and then from San Francisco down to Australia. Um, but I think it would be really cool to visit the country. It's really far away and isolated from everything else. And then, of course, you know, everybody talks really cool down in Australia. Sees you want to go to Mexico? I have actually never been to Mexico. I've been to Canada, but never Mexico. Um, I know we have a lot of students that uh, have family down in Mexico and get to visit there all the time. There's a lot of really cool places down in Mexico with awesome weather. All right, let's keep moving. So, um, you have a check-in to do this week. I'm not going to remind you every day this week. Uh, I think you guys have kind of got it. So, um, just make sure you do that. You just have to do it once per week. I started calling people today. <laughs> Cancun is fake. I don't know anything about Cancun. I just have seen pictures of it. It looks amazing. So, anyway, I started calling people that uh, I haven't seen or heard from since we uh, had our last day of school. So... Yeah, just make sure you do that once per week. Here's a plan for this week. All right, today you were supposed to have logged in and you should have done the intro to magnetism Google form. You had to watch a couple videos and then answer some questions. Um, Mr. Not put that together. It's all multiple choice. You can take it as many times as you want. Uh, tomorrow, we're doing a lesson that I put together. It is about magnetism in space. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, even if you're not interested in space, I think you'll have a new appreciation for the Earth's magnetic field after tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday, we're going to be playing around with a FET. And then Thursday, Friday, we're going to be working on a lab. Okay, The lab is pretty easy, and, but it's pretty cool because we're going to be playing with electromagnets. And then just a reminder, Friday is our uh, Zoom check-in. And it's going to be at midnight this week. Super stoked about that. I'm going to stay up in my pajamas and we're going to just talk about whatever. So that'll be Friday at midnight. So today, as promised, we're going to talk about magnets um, and then see if I can give you a little preview of what we're doing later this week. <clears throat> so um, when you think of magnets, you probably think of something that looks like this, right? You know, you, got the, you know, it's painted red and it's got the two silver tips and it'll like pick up things. Yeah, so that's what's commonly known as a ferromagnet. And let me link this if you're interested. I'll post this link in the chat. Uh, a ferromagnet is a material that has a permanent magnetic field. Um, so most of the uh, ferromagnets that you've probably experienced before have probably been like iron. And basically the way these work is they have a permanent magnetic field. Um, or these are materials that are attracted to magnets. So you've probably used a magnet at some point in your life to like pick up paper clips or, um, you know, they're, they're everywhere. They're in everything. Like your, some of your, some cabinets have magnets in them, you know, to keep them shut. Um, you've got magnets on your refrigerator to keep pieces of paper on the refrigerator. So yeah, that's a magnet. You've heard of those before. So here's an example of a magnetic field, which is something that we're going to be talking about over the next couple days. All right. Now, Magnetic field looks a lot like a, an electric field because you've got the little lines going around, right? Um, so yeah, it functions just like it. You've got um, coming out of the north end, 
you've got the electric field flowing into the south end. It's like the electric field which flows out of the positive end and goes into the uh, negative end. Now, you might think that, oh, well, I can just take this magnet and cut it in half, right? Right here where the N and the S meet. And I'll just have one side that's positive and one side that's negative, right? Can't do that because that would be breaking physics. You cannot have what's called a monopole. There's always going to be a north and a south end. So if you were to split that magnet in half right at the north and the south, where you split on the north end here, so like if you split it right down the middle here, this would now be the new south pole for this part of the magnet, and this would be the new north pole for that end of the magnet. All right. Um, so where else do we use magnets? We talked about magnets on the refrigerator. We talked about, uh, I already can't remember what I just said. Magnet on the refrigerator, magnet to keep like doors shut. Where else have you seen magnets before? Where else have you seen magnets before? We're using a lot of toys to do things. Um, hmm. Where else have we seen magnets before? You're using one right now, probably, right now. You're using a magnet. Caesar, are you still there? Caesar, where do you use magnets? You're probably using one right now and you don't even know it. Right now, inside your computer, there's a hard drive. And your hard drive inside your computer, that's what makes that spinning sound. I'm about to sneeze. I'm allergic to hard drives. How do I mute my mic? Oh, I'm allergic to I'm allergic to physics today. Anyway, the uh, hard drive inside your computer uses this big magnetic desk, disk to store information. Um, so if you're ever using a computer, you should keep magnets away from it. Um, if you have a magnet by your computer, you can actually uh, cause data loss because it messes up the hard drive. Um, you've probably heard that before. Some of the newer um, hard drives, or even like, uh, let me see if I have one of these, you know, like a flash drive. Flash drives, I don't believe, are affected by magnetic fields, but I might be wrong. Don't try it and blame me that you lost everything. All right, so those are basically, in a nutshell, magnets. You've probably heard of those before. You've probably played with those before. So we're going to pivot a little bit, and we'll start talking about magnetic fields. So you get this really cool app on your phone the Compass app. You've probably played with it before. Um, so let me pull mine up. Yes, yeah, so you've got the Compass app on your phone. And when it's pointing north, what is it pointing at? It's like if I take my compass right now and I point it north, which is that way, what's my compass pointing at? Right now, what am I pointed towards? Anybody know what that is? This is pretty tricky. Actually, on my phone, it like clicks when it turns. It's pretty entertaining. Like I could do a full circle in my chair. So when my compass is pointing north, what does that mean? <laughs> it's pointing at my wall. Fantastic. Way to really dig deep and give me a good physics answer. Yes, it's pointing at the wall, but my compass is also pointing towards what? So like if I take it outside, it's always going to point the same direction. Why is it, or what is what is north? What is it pointing at? Well, north on our compass is pointing towards the magnetic north pole of the Earth. Now, people get confused because there is the north pole, the geographic north pole, which on the Earth is the very top point of the Earth, and then there's the magnetic pole. They are not the same place. A lot of people get confused by that, all right? So um, if you look at this picture here, it says magnetic North Pole up here, but this is the south end of the compass. So like that's a little confusing, right? Why is the south end of this, uh, I said compass, the south end of this magnet pointed towards the north pole. Why is that end attracted to it? So remember, opposites attract. So, of course, the south end of this magnet is going to be attracted to the magnetic north pole. All right. So, as you can see, we've got our magnetic field lines coming out of the north end here, going into the south end, just like our electric field. Okay. 
So what does the magnetic north pole of the Earth look like? What does the north pole of the Earth look like? Anybody ever been there before? This is why I asked what country would you want to visit when we started. What does the North Pole look like? Well, it's pretty boring. Um, here's a picture of the North Pole, the actual North Pole. And if you notice the picture that this guy is standing next to, uh, it says the North Pole was here. And that's not a typo. Um, yes, nice job, Caesar. It is snowy. So that's not a typo. The North Pole was where he is standing, and the North Pole does move around. So before we get to why it moves around, uh, anybody interested in going to the North Pole? Uh, I wouldn't mind going there. So if you're ever interested in going to the North Pole, we're in a little tangent here. Uh, if you're ever interested in going to the North Pole, you can get there. Uh, it's very expensive, though. So there's a country, company, called Poseidon Expeditions that actually has trips going to the North Pole. Senya, what's going on? Senya, I'm so glad to see you in our physics live stream. We'll get to chemistry in like 15 minutes, 14 minutes, 14 minutes. Okay, so Poseidon Expeditions goes to the North Pole. Anybody want to guess how much it costs to go there? How much does it cost to go to the North Pole? Let me type this in the chat here. How much does it cost to go to the North Pole? Don't Google it. Don't Google the answer. How much does it cost to go to the North Pole? Any guesses? Can't be wrong. It's a guess. How much does it cost to go to the North Pole? Look at that. Conquer the top of the world aboard the most powerful icebreaker ever built. How much do you think it costs to go on that boat and go to the North Pole? Any guesses? Outside feels like the North Pole today. It's so cold. I put my like winter coat on to take my dogs out this morning. So windy. Expected it to start snowing. Well, uh, to visit the North Pole, it actually costs, on a cheap trip, $26,000. $26,000 to visit the North Pole. And that's when it's cheapest, in uh, like late July, early August. That's absolutely insane. Who would pay that much money to go somewhere cold, right? No, usually you would spend that kind of money to go somewhere warm in, in you know, like Florida or, or Cancun. Caesar says Cancun is like one of the best places to visit. Yeah, I would want to spend that. I mean, what kind of awesome vacation could you get for $26,000 somewhere warm. I mean, you could get like a suite. It would be amazing. Who would spend $26,000 to go to somewhere that's absolutely freezing? I don't know. The, I, I mean, I actually, you know what? At this point, because um, cause I've been isolated in my house and I'm going crazy at this point, I wouldn't mind going to the North Pole. But, you know, like normal, like not pandemic um, uh, circumstances, I don't know that I would spend that kind of money to go to the North Pole. Um, that's a lot of money. Caesar, you told me earlier that Cancun was like the best place. It's fake Mexico. I don't know about that. I'll I'll have to do some research. So anyway, so let's get back to the uh, the North Pole and why it moves around. Okay, because this is actually quite interesting. So the magnetic North Pole in 2019. So here is the geographic North Pole. So this is the very top of the Earth. Geographic North Pole is right here. Is that Jalisco? Is that how you pronounce it? Jalisco? I'm going to have to look that up when we're done. Anyway, so you've got the geographic North Pole right here. The magnetic North Pole is just to the west of that right now, uh, looking top down. But previously, if you notice, like in the 1600s, it was down here. In the 1700s, it was over here. The mid-1800s, it was here. And then since 1900, it's been kind of moving this way. So why is that happening? Why does the Earth's magnetic field keep changing? I had no idea that this was actually going on until, like, recently. Um, the North Pole, I, I knew that the magnetic North Pole and the geographic North Pole were not the same, but I had no idea that the magnetic North Pole was moving. Uh, it's not because of the ice melting. So I'm going to link this article in the chat here. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's actually a video. 
Uh, it's quite fascinating, but I didn't want to just show it because that would have been kind of cheap. Um, but there is, inside the Earth, um, there's what's called dynamo action. So, you know, you have the Earth's inner core and all this temperature and everything is kind of swirling around on the inside. So that mixture of molten lava and everything is causing what's called dynamo action, and it's causing the magnetic field to shift. Because think about it, we know that the Earth's inner core is metallic, and metals have some metal or, um, magnetic properties. So with the Earth's magnetic core kind of moving around like that, it's causing the Earth's magnetic field to change. So actually, I, again, this is something that just blew my mind when I knew about it. Uh, let me go back a little bit. So the Earth's magnetic pole actually will switch. It rotates. So the north becomes the south, and the south becomes the north. They actually trade off. Um, it ha it's, it's not like something that happens every couple of years. It takes a long, long time, thousands of years for this to happen, but they are constantly changing. So, you know, at one point, the North Pole was the South Pole, and they just kind of trade off. So I found that very fascinating. Um, so you can, if somebody asks you where the Earth's magnetic uh, north is, you can kind of tell them where it is, but you say right now because it's always going to be changing, All right? That is your cool science fact for today. So we have a couple extra minutes before I switch into chemistry. I know Senya is anxious, I can't even talk right now, anxiously waiting to get into some chemistry, um, but let me show you um, a couple things. First of all, let me download this. This is what we're going to be playing with. Well, this is part of what we're going to be playing with later this week. Here is a uh, simulation, and I want to switch this over to Earth. So here is the Earth, and you can see on the inside we have our magnet. So notice the south end of our magnet is pointing towards magnetic north, and then the north end of our magnet is pointed towards magnetic south. On the outside of our planet here, you see all these little compass symbols. And that's the direction of our magnetic field. So again, the magnetic field is leaving the magnetic north and going into the magnetic south. All right. So I can take my compass here, and as I move my compass around the Earth, you notice that it is changing here. Oops. Ugh, it's like stuck. All right, so as I'm moving the compass, notice my compass is always pointing towards this north end of the Earth. If I move it over to the other side, it kind of does the same thing. It turns, and now it's pointing towards the magnetic end, or the magnetic north of the planet Earth. All right, so that's pretty much the same thing that we were doing with our electro uh, electric fields. Functions the exact same way. So you're not really learning anything new here. You're just knowing that. Um, Magnetic fields and electric fields kind of function the same way. All right. So I know that was a little bit of a taste of what we were doing. And let me show you something cool. Did you say ghetto? Caesar, you're not being helpful right now. Let me show you something that I've been working on very hard uh, for this week. You're going to just love this. I spent so much time making this. I actually posted a picture of this on my Twitter page, too, because I was so proud of my work. Um, we are going to be playing with an electromagnet this week. So we talked about ferromagnets, which is a metal that has a permanent magnetic field. All right, we talked about the Earth, which is a kind of magnet. It's got a magnetic field. All right, and then we're going to talk about electromagnets. This is a little preview of what we're going to be doing later this week. So I have a bolt and... Uh, I don't know if there's a better way to show you this. So I have a bolt, okay, and then around the bolt I took a wire and coiled it up, all right? On either end of the bolt, you see here, I've got the wire exposed, and then I have some batteries. So I have a D battery and I have a C battery, and then I have some paper clips. All right. So if I take my bolt with the wire wrapped around it, and if I put one end of the wire on the positive end and one end on the negative end, oops. 
I don't have a better way to show you this right now. So if I wire it up like this, if I take this down to my paper clips, look at that. It picks up paper clips. If I take my electromagnet and I release one of the ends, so I'm going to release the end from the negative end, notice the paper clips aren't really, one of them dropped off, one of them still sticking. But it kind of falls off there. So it's inducing a magnetic field. You've probably heard the word induce before, like if you're inducing labor, you're causing it to happen. So this is inducing a magnetic field. So let me do it one more time because I know it was so much fun watching me do this. So let me just pop this on here, making a magnetic field. I'm going to go pick up a paper clip. Tell me that's not cool. I went to four years of physics to be able to pick up a paper clip with a battery. Pretty cool, right? So later this week, we're going to be exploring uh, different types of electromagnets. So we're going to be using bigger batteries. We're going to be using um, different types of wire to kind of explore how these go. But it's going to be fun. Let me tell you. I went and bought a cool tripod to record some videos. And I'm just doing the best I can with what I've got. All right. I don't have all my cool toys that I have in my classroom. But I'm doing the best I can with what I've got. So we have like three minutes left. I need to quickly look up this place that Caesar is telling me is awesome. So if it's not cool, Caesar, um, I don't know what to tell you. All right. So we are looking up this place. Jalisco. Let's see here. Oh, there's a lake there. That looks nice. Um, very nice. Look at some mountains going on, right? Have you been there too? You know, this reminds me of like California almost, like Northern California looks just like this. That's really cool. Um, I wonder what they're growing there. I don't know. Let's go back and look again here. What else they got? It's like where in the uh where in the state is it? Oh, it's in the s Okay, so it's on the Pacific side, kind of in the middle. There are a lot of alcohol. <laughs> How would you know? You're not old enough to drink. I think even in Mexico is in the drinking age like 16 or something. Caesar. Um so like where do you fly into? Uh, Guadalajara. All right, I need to go to Mexico. Okay, I guess the most important question I have for you is, are there tacos there? Okay, I've heard of, is this Puerto Vallarta? Is that how you say it? I probably butchered that, I'm so sorry. Okay, good, because tacos is my favorite food, and if there's tacos there, I will do whatever I can to, to actually get there. So um, I wonder when it's going to be safe to travel because I need to go there. I mean, the tacos are good here, but I want real tacos, like authentic tacos. I'm kind of like a taco connoisseur, so I need to definitely go and try tacos down there. Is that the best place to go for tacos in Mexico? Like, where's the best place to go for tacos? Because, I, I mean, I could honestly, I could care less about everything else, like... I mean, yes, you know, it's fun to go and sightsee, but I'm all about um, trying different tacos. Love tacos. All I can think about is tacos right now and how I haven't had tacos in like a month and I'm starting to go crazy because I haven't had tacos. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and pivot over to chemistry because Senya's here. So for chemistry today... Uh, we're going to do some more multi-step problems. But before we do, I want to know if you could visit any country, what would it be? I don't go to Taco Bell, like ever, ever. It's not real. I go to the restaurant that's right behind the school. Um, most of the physics teachers go to the taco truck, but I'm a vegetarian. So taco truck's idea of a vegetarian taco is like, 
beans and rice. And the beans aren't even vegetarian. They usually have lard in them. So the restaurant next door has actual vegetarian tacos. So that's where I go. So Mexico, huh? What's What about your second country that you could go to other than Mexico? If you could pick anywhere else to go, where would it be? Because like Mexico is like the only answer that I've gotten all day today for the like two of you that are actually here. Cecilia, what's going on? Oh my God, it's so good to see you. Got two people from chemistry. I had nobody here on Friday for chemistry. Nobody. Nobody showed up. I was so sad. I was crying. I had to like cut my stream because it was so hard to continue on because it's just tears just streaming down my face because nobody showed up. Did you get a phone yet? Because we really got to talk. Cecilia, if you could go to any country, what would it be? I really miss like having lunch with you during advisory. We had a lot of really good conversations. Okay, well, Senya, here's the good news. Um, most of you I know are staying up at night and sleeping during the day, so I'm going to do my weekly Zoom this Friday at midnight to catch all the people that I keep missing because of, um, you know, at work last week because playing catch up uh, and I would go to <laughs> God this is what I've missed right here all of these yeah at midnight at midnight because there are quite a few people that okay so let me tell you something astronomy club we did a stargazing party at three in the morning three in the morning and we had 15 people show up I was about to cry because I can't get anybody. I what, How many people are watching right now? Four. I can't get more than like four or five people to show up to my live streams. Uh, and we had 15 people come to Astronomy Club to look at the stars. People were outside in their pajamas on a cold night looking up at the sky. So I'm thinking maybe if I do my Zoom chat at midnight, people will show up. So we're going to give it a shot. We're going to give it a whirl. Well, other than Mexico, because now I know Mexico. Well, actually, I know where in Mexico. <laughs> See, I use Zoom once a week, but then, like, nobody, I don't know. Maybe I'll switch over to Zoom full-time because I don't like the one-way uh, one way interaction here. So if I could go anywhere, I would go to Australia because it's really far away, and it's the land down under. There's kangaroos down there. There's koalas, and they talk in Australian. And I really don't know much about Australia. So I know I know that Tom Hanks got COVID down there and he survived. So they must be doing something right down there. Either that or he's rich and can afford like really good doctors. I don't know. Did you guys see that he hosted Saturday Night Live uh, like this week or something or the last week? He did the monologue from his kitchen. <sighs> Cecilia, we really need to talk. Um... Can you, we should Skype or something later. I need to talk to you about chemistry and then we'll talk about math. Anyway, let's keep going. All right, so make sure you check in. Um, yep, make sure you guys check in with that Google form. I sent you the link this morning in that email. Here's the plan this week. So today and tomorrow we're doing some more multi-step calculations. Uh, I'm gonna go through some of those problems right now. Wednesday, your calorimetry lab is due. Um, we're also going to, I'm going to open the quiz for this week on Wednesday, and then you'll have the rest of the week to finish that quiz. So on Wednesday and Thursday, I'll just be reviewing on uh, my live stream. You're not going to get anything else those days, so you can focus on uh, taking the quiz. And if you need to, you can take the quiz more than once, right? Um, there is optional practice in OneNote. I'm going to go through some of those practice problems here in a few minutes, and that's it. And then don't forget the Zoom Friday morning at midnight. All right, so if you want to follow along with me. <laughs> yeah, we, need to, we still need to talk. We, sh we still need to talk, trust me. It'll take five minutes, five minutes. How do you not have a phone? Like, wh what happens if there's an emergency and you need to call uh, Superman? Is there not a on, there's not a phone where you're staying right now? 
I don't think you've ever called me homie before. Anyway, so if you want to do these with me, uh, if you go to your homework folder in one step or uh, one note, there's a multi-step calculations practice. Um, I no, I don't think so. No, you're good. Nolan, Nolan's here too. There's six people. This is like the most people that have ever come to a live stream ever, and you're all here on chemistry, which everybody hates chemistry. You tell me all the time. I get the I hate it here every day. Although I don't get that at home. Nolan, I'm so proud of you. I am going to be putting those in this afternoon, so that's going to be amazing. I should I should email your mom and tell your mom that you've been doing really well in class. All right. Well, let's go through these because this is what our quiz is going to be on this week. So multi-step calculations. You might have to just sync your notebook. If it's not working, I'm not grading this extra practice. If you want to just do it on paper, you can. Uh, I'm going to go through the whole um, front side of this. So if you want to do it with me on paper, you can. If you want to just watch me do it and type nasty things to me while I'm doing it, that's fine too. Um, so my plan is just to work through these. I'm the only physics. Well, physics is supposed to be 1 to 130, and then chemistry is 130 to 2. I don't want to, like, stop the stream and start it again. But you're welcome to you're welcome to hang out and listen to chemistry. All right. So we're talking about heating curves and cooling curves. Is this a heating or a cooling curve? Nolan. Which one is it? Heating or cooling? Heating or cooling. Which one is it? <laughs> okay. Someone tell me, is this a heating or a cooling curve? Heating or you have fifty percent chance of getting it right. It is a heating curve. <laughs> Neither. This is a heating curve because we are starting at forty and we are climbing up to 140. So it's being heated. Our temperature is increasing. If it was a cooling curve, it would be going the other way. It would be starting out with a high temperature and our curve would be going down to a lower temperature. Okay, so that's how you can tell. I'm a little worried if you didn't know, but that's okay. It's all right. I mean, I get that you guys have other things to do right now. Okay, so this is a problem typical of what you might see on a test. First question says, where does the liquid begin to increase in temperature? All right. So before we do that, let's talk about what's going on here. So on our curve, anywhere there is a diagonal is when we are either a solid, liquid, or gas. Omar, what's up? So, oops. So this point here, from A to B, we are in which state? Solid, liquid, or gas? Solid, liquid, or gas. Caesar, you need to back off. From A to B, are we solid, liquid, or gas? Oh, geez. <laughs> From A to B, solid, liquid, or gas? Solid, liquid, or gas? Solid. It is a solid, yes. All right, going from C to D, we are a liquid. And then from E to F, we're a gas. All right, now, anywhere there's a plateau on our graph is when we're changing states. So from B to C and from D to E, we're changing states. So let me label this. This is solid, this is liquid, and this is gas. All right, and then let me throw in some points here. Okay, gas, Never mind. I'm lost. Okay, well, just think about ice. Ice is the solid form of water, all right? And at a low, that happens at the lowest temperature. As you start to warm up your ice, it becomes liquid. <laughs> as you warm up your ice, it becomes liquid. And then as you continue to warm up liquid, it becomes a gas. Come, it becomes water vapor. So low temperature is a solid, like ice cube. As you warm it up, it becomes a liquid. It melts. And then as you continue to heat it, it becomes a gas. All right? So this is the same thing. So we're at a low temperature here, this specific liquid. Uh, from 40, anything below 60 degrees is a solid. And then from 60 to 120 degrees, it's a liquid. And then from 80 and above, or I'm sorry, 120 and above, it's a gas. Okay, so water on the Celsius scale is a solid up until it hits zero degrees. And then it's a liquid from zero to 100. 
And then from 100 and above, it's a guess. You know this. Come on. All right, so the question says, where does the liquid begin to increase in temperature? Oh, what's happening there? That's a good question, Omar. So have you ever looked at an ice cube, like really close? Next time you pull an ice cube out of the freezer, I want you to try to look at the surface of the ice cube because there's a lot happening and it's happening really fast, all right? So I want you to look at the surface of the ice cube the next time you bring it out of the freezer because it's not all solid. So take a look at that ice cube. There's a lot going on at once in your hand. Okay, so uh, where does the liquid begin to increase in temperature? So if you look on our graph, we know that from C to D, we're a liquid. So where does the liquid begin to increase in temperature? Which point? It's got to either be C or D. It is C, yes, because C is where we've transitioned from a solid to liquid, and now we're starting to climb that curve. Okay, so C is correct. Okay, where does kinetic energy increase? Kinetic energy is energy of motion. Okay, temperature is how we measure kinetic energy. So just think about, um, let me try to think of, I can't think of a good example right now. I was gonna try to relate it to something that you've probably seen. Um, but if you know the temperature is where kinetic energy increases, anywhere on the graph that you have a change in temperature would be where you have an increase in kinetic energy. So any of those slopes, G is where it's a gas. So any of those yellow slopes is where we're going to have an increase in uh, kinetic energy. So from A to B, from C to D, and then from E to F. So anywhere on the graph where we have a slope, we're increasing temperature and our kinetic energy is changing. All right, it says, uh, what is the melting temperature? What is the melting temperature? So if we know we're a solid from 40 to 60, and we know we're a liquid from 60 to 120, what's the temperature that we melt? So think about the word melting. What does that mean in terms of ice? It's going from what to what? 60. Which came first, the smoke or the liquid? Omar, you're going to have to take chemistry next year to find out. Uh, the melting temperature is 60 degrees Celsius, B to C. Yeah, so B to C is occurring at 60 degrees. Good. All right, so what's the freezing temperature? Let's think about what happens when you're freezing. You're going from what to what? What state to what state? And then look at the graph. What's the freezing temperature here? Soren, this is boring. Cecilia, well, I'm sorry. I'm doing the best I can. This is no different than regular chemistry. It's probably cooler than regular chemistry because I get to wear a headset. 59 degrees. Well, 59 degrees, you're still a liquid. It's at 60 degrees that we are freezing. Because if you look here, freezing is going from liquid to solid. It's going the other way. So you're freezing and melting at the same temperature, right? Think about it. Ice turns to liquid. <laughs> Celia, we really need to talk. Really need to talk. So you need to just give me five minutes, not even five minutes after this. Figure out, a, I, can just, I can just Skype call you. Just answer the call, give me five minutes of your time, and everything will be fine. Anyone else still in bed? <laughs> we just need to talk about chemistry. Just trust me. No ice to port me. Oh, geez, Caesar. Ah. Okay, so anyway, with ice, ice melts at zero degrees Celsius. Ice our water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. So whether you're going this way from liquid to solid or you're going from solid to liquid, this same point is where you both melt and freeze. So I guess that's the point I'm trying to make with this. 
All right. Um, so we have a two-step and a three-step. Okay. These are the calculations that we we're working on Thursday. So I'm going to go through how to do these. This is definitely something you might see on a test. So I want to make sure that you're all familiar with how to do these, except Caesar. Uh, we need to figure out a time when we can talk, whether I call you at a phone number or I can do Skype or Zoom. You just tell me when. We definitely need to talk, though. Okay. So it says, how much energy is needed to heat 15 grams of solid? Okay, well, that's why we're going through these. How much energy is needed to heat 15 grams of solid at 60 degrees to a liquid at 120 degrees? Okay, yeah. Um, don't type it in the chat, though. Can you maybe email it to me after? Because uh, I don't want Caesar to call your mom. All right, so uh, again, the question says, how much energy is needed to heat 15 grams of solid at 60 degrees to a liquid at 120 degrees? All right. So let's take a look at our graph here to try to understand what's going on. So it says, how much energy is needed to heat 15 grams of solid at 60 degrees? So solid at 60 degrees is point B, and we want to go to a liquid at point D, which is 120. So we have to first finish transitioning from a solid to a liquid, and then we have to climb all the way up to 120 degrees. So two things need to happen here. We need to change states from solid to liquid, and then we need to raise the temperature of our liquid from 60 degrees to 120 degrees. So there's two steps here. So the first step is to go from solid to liquid. So to go from solid to liquid, we're going to use the Q equals the M times the heat of fusion equation. You'll be given the heat of fusion. In our question, or in our, our givens up here, heat of fusion is right here. Okay? Heat of fusion is easy. I know it sounds complicated because you're like, fusion, what's going on? Um, so we're just going to multiply the mass, which in our question is given as 15 grams times the heat of fusion, which is 250 joules over grams. Can you, can you just email me the number? That's all I need you to do. And then we'll just talk and everything will be great. Okay, so 15 times 250 is 3750. All right, so uh, what we've done so far is we've calculated how to go from B to C. We've transitioned from a solid to a liquid. Now we need to raise our liquid's temperature all the way up to 120 degrees. So to do that, we're going to use the Q equals MC delta T equation. Now, when we use the Q equals MC delta T equation, the C is whatever state you're currently in. So we transition from a solid to a liquid. Now we're a liquid, we need to raise our temperature up. Anytime you're changing temperature, <laughs> stop calling me homie. Anytime you raise your temperature, you're using the Q equals MC delta T equation and you're gonna use the C for whatever state you're in. So we're a liquid, so we're gonna use the C of a liquid. All right, so I'm going to start to plug in. The mass is 15. The heat value, the heat capacity is 5.0 joules over grams degrees Celsius. And then the change in temperature. So we're going from 60 to 120 degrees. How many degrees difference is it from 120 to 60? 120 minus 60 is 60. Okay, so 15 times 5 times 60 is 
4,500 joules. All right, so what we did is we calculated the amount of energy it takes to go from B to C, and then we calculated the amount of energy it takes to go from C to D. How do we figure out how much total energy it took to go from B all the way up to D? So we figured out the two segments. How do we figure out how much total energy is from how much total energy we've used to go from B all the way up to D? <laughs> so like if you're trying to figure out if you're like Google and you know Google Maps, you know it's to figure out how long it or how much distance it is from like Joliet to Chicago. You got to figure out like how long you're on each individual street and then how does it get the total distance? just adds them up, right? So we're kind of doing the same thing. So we know how much energy it takes to go from here to here. We know how much energy it takes to go from here to here. So we're just going to add these two segments together. So we're going to add the energy from the first part to the energy of the second part. It sounds extra. Where are you getting all these new words? Homey, extra. Okay, so 3750 plus 4500 is... 8250. So from now on, like next year, I think I'm going to teach all my classes this way. Uh, I'm going to teach them on YouTube because you guys are on your phones anyway. So I figured I'm just going to have like a green screen behind my desk and a webcam on me. I'm just going to teach that way. Everybody will just be looking at their phones taking class. What do you think? <clears throat> Any questions on this first one? I know I might have gone a little fast. Where did you get stuck at? Don't say the whole thing. I know somebody's typing that right now. Were you saying no to teaching class on YouTube or no to you didn't understand anything? I know, but like my incoming classes. Well, you don't know that you might not have me next year. Maybe I'll teach uh, a different class. I'll teach math or something or gym. I shouldn't probably teach gym. I don't really look like the gym teacher type. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, we don't have any questions. Let's knock out this last one. It says, how much energy is needed to heat 5 grams of liquid at 80 degrees to a gas at 130 degrees? Uh, so what does the G stand for? So on my, on my um, diagram here, let me maybe use different colors because I think I might have been confusing. So the S is where you're a solid. The L is a liquid. And the G is where you're a gas. So you're a liquid, or sorry, you're a solid from A to B. You're a liquid from C to D and you're a gas from E to F. That's pretty much what I threw those letters in there for. G like down here, 15 grams. What other G are you seeing? G stands for grams. Grams, I don't know what you're talking about. Did you get it? Grams. I really, maybe we should switch to Zoom because I can't hear you screaming at me right now. I can just see you typing on the computer. But I know that you're yelling at your computer right now and typing like really angrily by the J. This G, this is joules over grams degrees Celsius. Those are the units. Or joules divided by grams. Those are the units. All right. Uno mas. I already know enough Spanish where I feel like I could get by down in Mexico. How much energy is needed to heat 5 grams of liquid at 80 degrees to a gas at 130? All right. So let's take a look at our diagram here. So we are... Let me get my highlighter out. We are going from... <laughs> we are going from... Uh, 80 degrees Celsius, which is like here, 
to 130 degrees, which is like here. All right. So the question already tells you that this is a three step. So step number one is going to be going from the 80 degrees to 120. So that's step one. You should send me a picture. Can you email it to me? Step two is going from liquid to gas. And then step three is going to be raising the temperature of our gas. Okay, so those are the three steps. So again, one more time, we're starting at this point right here. We're starting there. That's the initial temperature of our liquid. So we need to raise the temperature up to the point when it transitions from a liquid to a gas. Then we need to transition from a liquid to a gas. That's step two. And then step three is we need to raise the temperature of our gas, okay, to 130 degrees. So three steps here. All right, so step number one is raising the temperature of our liquid. So that's going to be Q equals MC delta T. So the mass is 15 grams, or sorry, 5 grams. So 5 grams. The C value of liquid is 5.0. And then the change in temperature. We're going from 80 degrees to 130 degrees, but for step number one, we're going from 80 degrees to 120 degrees. So we're not using the whole change in temperature. We're only using the change in temperature from 80 to 120. And the difference between 80 and 120 is 40. So 5 times 5 times 40 is 1,000 joules. Yes, there's a Zoom at midnight on Friday. Uh, it's because uh, I've been told that most people are awake at night and asleep during the day. So I want to make sure that I'm hitting everybody, giving everybody the same opportunity. I had 15 people join me for Astronomy Club um, Friday last week. We had 15 people. And here's the really weird thing, okay? Mr. Hallahan, I posted <clears throat> at 3 in the morning on my Twitter that we were doing this uh, stargazing party. At 3 in the morning, he liked that post. Like within two or three minutes of posting that at 3 in the morning, he liked it. It's weird that he was awake at that time and on Twitter. Okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> so that's part number one. So part number two, if you go back to our diagram, exactly. So I feel like midnight would be perfect to kind of get that whole uh, demographic of people that are staying up. Part two, we're transitioning from a liquid to a gas. So for part two, oops. Part two, we're going to use the heat of vaporization. Q equals heat of vaporization. So you use heat of fusion when you're doing any calculations from B to C. You use the heat of vaporization anytime you're doing calculations where you're going from a liquid to a gas or a gas to a liquid. I told you we were doing a, an astronomy club stargazing party. We were looking up at the looking up at the stars. So the mass is five grams, and the heat of vaporization. If you go back up to here. So the heat of fusion is when you're going from liquid to solid or solid to liquid. The heat of vaporization is when you're going from liquid to gas or gas to liquid. So that is 750 joules. So 5 times 750 is 3750. So we've gone from, we did, we did the first part, so we raised the temperature of our liquid. We did the second part, so we transitioned from a liquid to a gas. 
The third part, we need to transition up, or we need to raise the temperature of our gas. So we need to raise our temperature of our gas by 10 degrees. You act like I listen. <laughs> I'm just doing my job. All right, so for this last part, for part C, uh, since we're raising the temperature of our gas, we're going to use the Q equals MC delta T equation. So the mass of our gas is 5 grams. The C, the specific heat value for our gas, is 2 joules over grams times degrees Celsius. It's easier you're here every day. You probably could teach. Oops, let me go back down. Um... And then we're multiplying that by the change in temperature. <clears throat> so there's a total difference of 50 degrees going from here to here. So we've already accounted for 40 of the 50 degrees. So the last 10 degrees is what we're looking at right here, going from E to F. Or sorry, going from E to this green spot. Caesar probably could teach chemistry. Okay, so 5 times 2 times 10 is 100 joules. I mean, I don't have a degree in chemistry, and I can teach chemistry somehow. <laughs> so just like with the last one, just like with the last one, we are going to add all of the different pieces up now to get the total energy. So 1,000 plus 3750 plus 100 is 4850 joules. piece of cake, right? So if you thought that was really difficult and you had no idea what was going on, tomorrow I'm going to work through some more of these. So tomorrow we're going to do a cooling curve. Uh, if you want to join me, uh, if you're really struggling and you want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, <laughs> well, it's hard, it's, hard to, it's hard to get through to some people when they're on their phones all the time. It's okay. Or doing their math homework. Um, so if you feel like you need extra help, remember, I'm going to live stream every day. Um, you can also sign up for tutoring one-on-one. -on -one. I do it through Zoom. It's in the mornings from 9 to 11. So we'll keep doing more practice. So the quiz that we're going to have this week is going to be over this type of stuff. All right. So we'll just keep practicing this until we get it. Um, and that's kind of the plan. Everything's been slowed down a lot compared to what you're doing in class. So take advantage of it. And if you guys don't have any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Um, Cecilia, can you email me that phone number? And I'm going to call really quick if that's okay with you. And then that's it. So it's good to see you guys. Looks like, um, actually, it looks like the sun is coming out now a little bit. Maybe. I'm going to go outside and enjoy the day when I'm done here after I talk to Cecilia. So I will see you guys tomorrow. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And that's it.